All right, my friends, today we are talking with John Will about blue belts. That's right, my friends. Today we have John Will on the show answering questions about blue belts. We've got five questions lined up for him. Hope you enjoyed the interview and hope you learned something. So here we go. Do you have any requirements for a blue belt? And if you do, what are they? Um, yes, I do. Um, I, I, I haven't got, just to put it in context, post blue belt, we're not so big on that. But I think blue belt's so important because it represents the foundation. Uh, so there are, you know, requirements. There are minimum requirements. Obviously, by the time someone's ready to go for a blue belt or they receive their blue belt, they know a lot more. But the bare bones that I would expect every single blue belt that they'd be tested on that um, are a number of things. There are basically um, four positional drills. I'd like to give you an example of one. Um, you know, basic basic single leg guard pass to side control, side control onto the mount from the mount and upa escape and then the other guy does it that would be an example of one so i have four of those i've got four fundamental drills um for first stripe on the white belt second stripe on the right belt white belt is four sweeps and four chokes third stripe would be four arm bars and four americanas and kimuras and then fourth stripe would be eight escapes um, because I think believe heavily in working defense before blue belt. So yeah, th there are all those requirements. I, I mean, that, that's obviously bare bones. Um, but you know, they would also know plenty of other things. Like you, you notice that triangle is not included in there and omoplata and stuff. So, but by the time someone's done two years training to blue belt, which is on average two years, they know a heck of a lot more than those things. So that's like a bare minimum requirement, if you like. Are you really looking mm. at those things, wanting them to be uh, fine-tuned and not have any mistakes, or you just want to see them, uh, that they're aware of them and then they could perform them at a, a proficient level? No, no mistakes. <laughs> no. Um, well, well, well let, let me qualify that. When someone's going for their first stripe, you know, and they're just doing the four positional drills, obviously, you know, I – as long as they can kind of get through it, I'm okay. By the time they go for their second stripe and learn, you know, they've got to show their four sweeps and four chokes, then I expect a higher standard of everything. And so at third stripe, again, arm bars and figure fours and kimuras, I expect a higher standard again. You know, so obviously I'm a little bit more uh, flexible at the very beginning, but I become less, fle more, less flexible as, as we go through. So if someone's been training for a year and a half, um, I would expect them to be technical, technically very proficient with all of those things. Now, if you can't see somebody uh, on a regular basis, can they go from no stripes to two or three or even a blue belt if they're able to perform all these at one sitting? No, we don't. I don't do that. They, they've got to go through it. I, I, I need, I need, I, and I do see everyone on a regular basis. So it's kind of okay. Uh, <laughs> but, 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 but um. No, I, I, I'm really, you know, I think every blue belt should know. There are things they should know. It's like, you know, there, there has to be some, in my view, there has to be some standards and not just standards based on their rolling ability. Um, you know, the problem with that, of course, is that, you know, someone might have an awesome guard pass and side control, um, but they've got no understanding of guard play. You know, so I don't want it to be based on, um, just their wrestling ability, uh, I, I want it to be based on their knowledge as well. So I, they, you know, I, when I look at a blue belt in my school, I know he knows at least all these things. I know that looking at him, and then I build on top of that. So it's very important for me that uh, every blue belt knows these certain things. Does that make sense? Yes, it, yes, it does. Uh, moving on to the next question here, how important is it for a student to be able to defend their belt that would rarely happen. I mean, it's possible, but in, in my school, it kind of doesn't happen that much. That it wouldn't. So you know, uh, anything can happen. Of course, you know, we we move left when we should have moved right, and things happen. And of course, the rule needs to be you know tap before you get injured. So it can happen, but it just generally doesn't in my school. I mean, I guess that's because someone's you know training two years to get their blue belt. So. 
biggest training, you know, they're reasonably efficient. The people that could tap them maybe would be, you know, a fourth stripe white belt who's just about ready to turn blue belt himself. And they're, in my particular school, they're two different classes. Like I don't put everyone in the one class. There's a novice class, an intermediate class, and an advanced class. So, you know, someone that's like a third or fourth stripe white belt are in an intermediate class. And what I do with my intermediate and advanced class, which one, one runs after the other, I let them share 15 minutes. So 15 minutes, I let the intermediates come on and they share 15 minutes with the advanced class. So those, those fourth stripe white belts are rolling with the blue belts and purple belts and brown belts and black belts for 15 minutes before those advanced guys then leave and go off and the class becomes just for the intermediates. Do you know what I mean? So, so there is some sharing going on um, 15 to 20 minutes usually. So, at, so the, the, on the odd occasion, I guess, you know, a four-stripe white belt, you know, you might snag a blue belt or someone, but it doesn't usually happen that much. But, no, I, I'm certainly not – I'm not – I don't require that they defend their belt. It just happens to be that they that's the they do that. When you're uh, considering somebody uh, to get uh, a stripe or a new belt, it sounds like you've got mm. a lot of technical things that you look at. Do you ever look at the intangibles? Like, are they a good teammate? Do they have a good attitude? Are they helping their helping others on the mat? Do those things come into play at all for the blue belt? For blue belt, yes. I mean, first of all, the culture that I've got going. On my mat, I'm pretty big on the culture. Um, so by the time someone's going to get the blue belt, they have either they have either adapted to our culture or they are no longer there. So you know, if, if someone's a, uh, if someone's like to take the worst example, toxic on the mat, I, I ask them to leave my school well before they get to that class. So so um, I, I've only got everyone that's on the board with the culture there. So usually those intangibles are already, you know, the, the culture stuff is already in place. Other intangibles, yes, like, for example, not only do they need to know the syllabus, but consider this, they've been rolling for, you know, at least 18 months. So their rolling is usually fine. So what I, what I look for, if I had to pick one intangible for blue belt, say, for example, I said, let's not have any techniques. What am I looking for in that blue, in, for a person to become a blue belt? The one thing that I would insist on is their ability to transition when a position or a move or a technique is no longer tenable. So, for example, a brand new white belt will be trying to, um, you know, they'll be on the mount trying to execute a Kimura, I mean, Americana, and they're getting put in the guard. And they're ignoring that and they keep trying to do the Americana and they end up in the guard. So they've been over-focused on what they were trying to do rather than assessing what's actually happening in the role and then changing their plan accordingly. So the ability to give up an untenable position and move on would be, to me, the, the most important thing that would, that would tell me that person's ready for a blue belt. That coupled with knowledge of the curriculum, those two things together. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's uh, uh, I really enjoyed uh, hearing about the untenable uh, technique that you're trying and whether or not you should transition before it's too late. And yeah, that that makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah, let go and move on. You know, let go and move on. Like if something's not working, let go and move on. And when people start out, they are too much. Um, they have too much. Uh, we call ox's neck. You know, ox head, ox's neck, rat's head, ox's neck. You know that old saying. No. comes from uh, Miyamoto Masashi's Book of Five Rings. Uh, to embody the, the concept of the rat's head and the ox's neck simultaneously is a really important one to get hold of. Rat's, ox's neck meaning you're all about intent, focus. Nothing's going to stop you doing what you want. Rat's head meaning I'm all about looking around, looking for other opportunities, keeping adaptable. Seemingly opposite ideas. So – Usually beginners have too much oxygen, you know, I want to do that, I want to do that, I want to do that, and they're, they're not looking around at what's going on and what they need to do. So, um, yeah, you've got to develop some rat's head in those people. So I want a balance of oxygen, neck, and rat's head in the blue belt. I, I had never heard that before, but it, uh, the way you explained it, it does make sense. There you go, <laughs> yeah. John, do, do you ever regret giving somebody a blue belt? 
I, I, I don't regret ever having done that in the terms of d- did they deserve the belt? Like, like no. Every, every one that blue belt that I can recall ever awarding was well-deserved in terms of their training and the effort they put in. Of course, there have been occasions, because I've been teaching for quite a while over the last 30 years, where I've, you know, something's gone south with the relationship post Blue Bell. Um, and then, of course, you know, I, if I was to be petty, I could say, you know, kind of regret being involved in their journey at all. Um, that's a rare thing, Byron, and understand it's over 30 years, right? So over 30 years, stuff happens. Um, so there's, there are people that I regret having had a relationship with, but no one I could say, you know, that person didn't deserve it. If, if you, I just want to make that distinction there. Yeah. I I think if looking back at myself as a blue belt, one of my big things, I didn't want to disappoint my coach. I didn't want to make them feel like that it was a mistake to give me that belt. And hearing this from you, uh, it feels like it's really not a problem that, that they should be particularly worried about. Oh, no. And in terms of are you, are you more talking about like – ability slash proficiency and all that stuff. Yeah. Like, yeah, right. <laughs> Look, I, I think, I mean, in terms of when I remember when I got my purple belt, I thought there's no way I'm a purple belt. I'm <laughs> going to disappoint my coach. I'm already a disappointment. <laughs> like for, um, but I think a lot of people who, may, maybe even the majority of people think they're never quite ready for the belt. But I don't think the coach thinks that. And besides, not all people are equal, right? Everyone's different. And, and someone who's training twice a week who's a businessman and some kid who's training 12 times a week who's got nothing to do, <laughs> um, I mean, they're, they're different people. So we can't expect the same level of performance out of those people. So I don't think, you know, we need to get too hung up on that stuff. It's are you the, the best blue belt you could be, you know? I mean, if you were to make a silly thing and say, say um, you know, blue belt, Black belt was the worst you'd ever be, and black belt was the best you'd ever be, which is not obviously not correct. But just to say that, then a blue belt would be: Are you a are you a quarter of the way there? You know, based on who you are. So if you're a seventy year old man that starts out as a white belt, I don't expect the same level of performance as someone who's eighteen, of course. So I'm not so hung up on that stuff. I don't think anyone should be. That's good to hear. Uh, John, what advice do you have for the new blue belt? Well, I mean, I if I travel back in time and wanted to give myself advice there, um, I, I, would, I would have been better off. And a few things. One, the first thing, in no particular order, but let's say if you haven't already developed the habit of paying attention to detail, detail, start now. So, like, you know, get into that habit. Don't, don't no longer sit, as of after a blue belt, it's no longer time to settle for big picture, broad strokes. You want to start to bury into detail and become a, 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 someone who appreciates nuance and detail. Uh, one thing that could help you do that, which helped me do that, but I didn't do it until purple belt, was by asking five simple questions for every technique I ever learned. What is the task of my right hand in the technique? Say, like talking about a, a flower sweep or something. What exactly is the function of my right hand? What's it doing? What's it contributing to the technique? Same thing for left hand, same thing for left foot, same thing for right foot. So that's four questions. What is each limb doing? And then on what angle to make it five questions? So if you – when I started doing that, you know, I couldn't help but have an 80% pass rate on what the technique was about, what made it work, why did it work. If I was really super clear on what does my right hand do, left hand do, right foot do, left foot do, and on what angle. In doing that, I think you're going to get a re- get your head wrapped around uh, the technique uh, in a much better way. So that would be you know, really start to develop that habit. Always ask the five questions. Um, I, I, I would encourage all blue belts to embrace the suck. You know, like like don't put yourself in bad positions. You know, you might be 
rolling with some white belts. Well, find the white belt with the best mount, go underneath the mount, start there. Find the white belt with the best guard, go in his guard. Instead of, instead of avoiding the drama, embrace the drama. So embracing the suck um, would be something that I think blue belts absolutely should do rather than avoiding the suck. Um, it, it's, it's also a good t- time to start developing a game, a basic game. Uh, I don't think people should develop a game before blue belt. I think they should get be focused on getting all the fundamentals down, you know, wrap their heads around the broad landscape um, of what BJJ is. Um, so don't, you know, don't don't start developing a triangle game, you know, to the exclusion of everything else. As a white belt, I think blue belt's about getting the fundamentals down. But post blue belt, start to develop a game, um, you know. And, and I guess if people ask what that is, have a have a favourite passing idea a favourite guard, attacking slash sweeping idea, and then a finishing plan for when you're on top. So that would be minimum three things. And maybe take down. So make it four. There you go. So um, so I would I would develop begin developing a game. And fifth thing, so be 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 the training partner everyone everyone wants to roll with. So if it's time to pair up and roll and everyone's running away from you you're not a good training partner. (laughs) If everyone's running at you, that's the person you want to be. So be that guy or girl, you know, be the person that everyone wants to roll with. That's a great way, a great, great thing to have as a blue belt. If you haven't got that by before blue belt or purple belt, you have probably got going to have troubles down the track. A lot of uh, great tangible advice that people could act on. Um, Not just, you know, train hard every day, uh, things that people could actually do and start implementing now. And, and the last one is a social one, which will help them uh, long-term uh, have success and happiness on the mat. Oh, yeah. yeah, They're, That's pretty important because you need people to train with. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the more people you can get to train with, with the widest variety of games and talents and skills, then, then the better off you're going to be. They're going to, the better people are going to inoculate you against uh, the drama and the people that you're not so, that aren't as good as you um, allow you to develop and hone techniques that you already have or techniques you're working on. So we need a, a, you know, a wide variety of people. It's hard to become really technical and good with four guys in a garage because everyone's fled from you. A lot of great advice today. Thank you, John. My pleasure, Byron. That wraps up our interview with John Will. We've got five other interviews with five other black belts answering the same five questions. So you heard John Will answer these questions. We also have Tim Sled, Matt Thornton, Bernardo Faria, Dan Koval, and Henry Akins. Check it out down below. The links to all those interviews are there for you to check out. I know you'll enjoy those interviews as well. It's fun to hear the different perspectives of the different uh, top coaches we have on the show. And uh, you get a lot of knowledge and information from what they expect out of their blue belts and what they have going on. Hope you like the video. That helps out a ton. Comment down below with your thoughts and the insight you have towards this interview. And subscribe to the channel to check out more Jiu-Jitsu action in the future. And stay sweaty, my friends.